Three, two, one. We are live. Welcome to the third Rancher Advocacy Program Summit, where we tackle the most important question of our lifetimes. What can farmers do on their land to thrive without using animals? We are in the midst of a climate crisis, fires, floods, drought all around us. Animal agriculture is a main reason why literally destroying our planet. So let's help these Farmers and ranchers transition to something that's more planet healthy. Hi, I'm Jane Velez Mitchell. I'm the founder and editor of JaneUnchained.com, a nonprofit news network for animal rights and the vegan lifestyle. And my co-host is Renee King Sonnen. She gained fame as a cattle rancher's wife who had an epiphany. She woke up and realized she could not stand by as the cows and other animals were sent off to slaughter. She turned her husband's cattle ranch into a farmed animal sanctuary called the Rowdy Girl Sanctuary and made global news and history. And we're going to go straight out to Renee King Sonin now because she has breaking news. Animals just arriving at the sanctuary now. Take it away, Renee King Sonin of Rowdy Girl Sanctuary in Texas. Thank you so much, Grace. And I'm so humbled and honored to be on the cutting edge of breaking news regarding two beautiful souls that just came to Rowdy Girl Sanctuary last week. We have a video that will be rolling just any minute about Grace and Randy and a rancher named Mary. This is Mary. And Mary, bless her heart, called me not too long ago about the struggle she was having because she was falling in love and had fallen in love with Grace right here and her son, Randy. They traveled five hours to Rowdy Girl Sanctuary to bring them to Rowdy Girl to safety. Okay. Listen. Uh, I've raised Grace from a infant. She was... She came up on our farm and she's I braced her for a long time with now she has a problem with a mastitis so I have to I have to, to, to uh, give her to another home and one of the many problems farmers have when they let go of their animals is you know letting people know that yeah they have mastitis but what's really going to happen if she's non-productive and would go to slaughter grace would go to slaughter a baby she bottle fed since birth and little Randy would have met a tragic fate as well. And now, little Randy exits another red trailer to Rowdy Girl Sanctuary. I get goosebumps thinking that this little boy that is so sweet would have been slaughtered. And next comes his beautiful mother. Grace is so, so sweet. She is the most calm, docile being. Meet Grace. Forever safe at Rowdy Girl. Traveled five hours on the road in the heat. And this Monday, Mary and her husband, the cattle rancher, are coming back to Rowdy Girl to see Grace and her baby Randy. These animals, the very next day, were walking with me through the compound, getting used to their surroundings. I know that they felt the peace. The baby kissed my fingers and everyone around knew they were here. It was calm, it was peaceful, and they are gonna be forever free at Rowdy Girl Sanctuary. How about a moment of sweet silence for these two? And now, y'all, get this. The Rancher Advocacy Program turned three years old on July the 19th. It's hard to believe Woo! that three years ago, we launched the RAP website. The Rowdy Girl Sanctuary and Rancher Advocacy Program is making history. Let's roll the video. We have a video about to roll our new PSA of the farmers that are trans that are um, that are want to transition. Can we roll the video? Mm -hmm. 
And and while he's trying to get the uh, video to roll, as soon as it rolls, I'll stop talking. Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, the Rancher Advocacy Program started with a real change of heart. Uh, in the last Our story landed in the laps of people all over the world. Farmers and ranchers everywhere started reaching out to us. Hey there, y'all. My name is Renee King Sonnen. And I'm her husband, Tommy Sonnen. Cattle ranching has been in my family for generations. And until a few years ago, we had a ranch here in Texas. But then I had a change of heart. We had always loved our animals. But now, even though we didn't have a way out, I just couldn't send them to slaughter anymore. Hell, I thought she was crazy. Well, soon after, we turned our land into a sanctuary for farm animals. People came a calling. It turned out that many people feel just like we do and want to make a change. They just don't know how to do it. Or how else to make a living. We started the Rancher Advocacy Program to help farmers and ranchers learn how to thrive on their land and make a good living in a new way without using animals. But before you start growing anything, you need a market and a buyer. That's why we just launched a pilot program to match farmers with plant-based industries to help ensure they'll always have buyers for whatever they're growing. Like soy, oats, mushrooms, hemp, or some other commodity. Documentary filmmakers will be following us on our journey to transition cattle ranchers and animal farmers. So, if you're a farmer or a rancher looking to evolve beyond animal agriculture, please contact us. There is another way. You can work the land and feel good knowing that what you're producing is better for people, the environment, and the animals. We hope to hear from y'all real soon. Woohoo! We are excited about today. And we're very, very, very honored to introduce our current lineup of panelists for today's very important conversation. We have coming on today, Nicole Rosa Marino. Nicole Rosa Marino is going to really uh, give us so much insight into how she's helping the planet. We've got Tiffany Washington that's going to talk to us straight from Austin. And we also have the amazing Judy Mancuso. Judy Mancuso from California is gonna be shedding her wisdom on all of us. We have Rebecca Knowles, uh, all the way from Scotland uh, with Farmers for Stock Free Farmers, bringing with her the farmer in transition, Lawrence Candy. Also, we have the incredible, groundbreaking, absolute great bodybuilder, Dominic Thompson, that eats what elephants eat. And we're gonna, have, we're gonna hear from him. We're gonna hear from Helen Atto, the veganic goddess. And did I forget anybody? I don't think so. All right. Thank you so much, Jane. Why don't you tell us all about the challenges that we're all going to face as we transition farmers? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Renee. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it right now. But it's not. This is a challenge and we need everybody who is watching to join in and help. So you can form committees uh, that we are a part of to try to, after we do all the talking, put it into action. There's, um, of course, debt. These farmers are often treated like indentured servants by these overlords who live on Park Avenue in Beverly Hills and have never entered a farm or gotten their hands dirty in their lives. They're put in terrible debt. Then they have, of course, family and community pressure. By the way, they're often in contracts that are very hard to get out of. And if they try to get out of it, they fear being blackballed by the industry. So we're gonna help them do an end run around those challenges, Renee? Thank you so much, Jane. And right now we want to introduce to you, Rebecca Knowles. Rebecca is a Scottish-based grassroots movement. Um, she has created the most in, in, incredible uh, farming transition program in Scotland. She is uh, the daughter of a butcher, uh, or, or, or the daughter, the granddaughter of a butcher. She has a degree in agriculture science. Uh, she has a passion, much like I do, to transition farms out of animal ag and into a better way of life. The incredible Rebecca Knowles. Rebecca, why don't you tell us a little bit about 
why in the world do you want to transition farmers and what do you see as the greatest challenges? Rebecca. Thanks, Renee. Re really happy to be here today. Um, why do I want to transition farmers? Well, I've been involved in animal rights activism for about 20 years now and in vegan activism for about 13 years. And it occurred to me maybe around six years ago that if we really want to grow the vegan movement, obviously, we have to focus on production as well as consumption. And I think the large vegan organizations to date have focus very much on dietary change, changing what people eat. And obviously we need to change what farmers produce as well. So that's how the idea started. Um, fast forward to 2018, this was when a lot of the climate research came out about the impact of animal agriculture on the environment and on climate change. And so back then we began lobbying uh, Scottish politicians about the very much needed shift to plant-based agriculture and growing crops for human consumption. Um, and we were in one particular meeting with a couple of members of the Scottish Parliament and we were sort of lauding the benefits of growing crops for human consumption. Actually, these two guys who are on the screen right now, that's who we were with. And that's my colleague, Amanda, who's with me. Uh, and we were in this meeting uh, talking about how we need to shift to plant-based diets, growing crops for human consumption to save the planet. And one of these two gentlemen uh, stopped us in our tracks and said, you know, if you do this, you're going to put 60% of Scottish farmers out of business. And that kind of stopped us in our tracks. I mean, we disagreed with him, but we knew that we had to show that he was wrong. Um, and in that moment, Farmers for Stock Free Farming was really born. So what was he talking about when he said, if you shift to plant-based diets, if you shift to growing crops for human consumption, you're gonna put 70% of Scottish farmers out of business. Uh, he was talking about the fact that Scotland has quite a unique situation in that se about 77% of our agricultural land in Scotland is permanent grassland or rough grazing. In other words, it's deemed unsuitable uh, for growing crops for human consumption. And the only way it is said that we can make food from this permanent grassland is by grazing cattle and sheep. So these were the farmers he was talking about. So we had to address this issue. So what we did is we came up with our three roads uh, to stock free farming. Oh, that's me and my, my buddy digging my tatty patch, that last picture. Um, we came up with our three roads to stock free farming so that no farmer need be left behind and that every farmer can thrive. So what our three roads are is, first of all, growing crops for human consumption. If you've got the land that can support that, uh, growing food for human consumption. And we're also actually working to expand that area out so that we can grow more food on what, what has been classed as marginal land. We're even involved in a project right now to make protein for human consumption from grass, from grass and clover seeds. Yeah, I'll tell you about that later. I don't want to take too much time. It's very exciting. Um, so three rows to stock free farming. Number one, growing crops for human consumption. Number two, if you don't have land that you can grow crops on, you can get paid. There is funding to farm carbon capture by restoring native trees and ecosystems and the soil, that is the other option, is sort of what we might class as rewilding or ecosystem restoration is the second path. The third one is diversifying into non-traditional agricultural activities, maybe those related to tourism or adventure-based nature activities, repurposing buildings, repurposing land. And according to the Scottish government, farmers that diversify in that way make on average 20,000 pounds a year more than farmers that don't. So we really? have these really? roads, yeah, that every farmer can fit into. And from our three roads, we developed 100 ways to farm stock free, which is on our website. It's basically a catalog of 100 things uh, farmers can do. They're grouped under these nine things that you see on the screen. Uh, those are the nine categories and underneath those we've got 100 ways to farm stock free. I think we're about 110 at the moment. We keep, it keeps going up. 
So I want to jump in and say this is absolutely extraordinary. And now we're going to a farmer who is actually doing this and making history in the United Kingdom. Lawrence Candy of Northwood Farm. You are transitioning in the process right now from conventional cow farming to organic, veganic to make cereal. Tell us how and why you've done it. Oh. Hello everyone. Um, yes, well, I, I started my organic journey back in September of 2019. Um, I was looking to um, diversify the farm. I'm, I'm a relatively small farmer, so my priority is to add value to what, whatever the farm sells. So I decided to go down the organic road and that's the road I took beginning in September, 2019. Um, at the end of last year, about, um, November 2020, uh, I was told that I, I was, I should explain, I was a dairy farmer. So at that point, I was, my intention was to be an organic dairy farmer. But unfortunately, uh, well, for, for economic reasons, I wasn't allowed to, to go pursue that contract anymore. So I started to look at other options for the farm. So I so in November of that year, I did contact Bon, the Vegan Organic Network, and to, to mm -hmm. ask him advice about what other options I could do on an organic farm, as well, especially the emphasis on a stockless organic or organic farm. So we, we, we discussed that, and then I started to research it in more detail, and that's in January of this year, I met Rebecca, Farmers for Stock Free. So since then, Rebecca's being, being my right hand man, so to speak. Um, we've been looking at the markets, looking at all the possibilities. We've been looking at her, uh, at the models that she's described, and we decided to go down the, the van veganic cereal route. Um, the reason being is I'm a grassland farmer. I, I've had experience of growing um, cereals in the past, and that was the safest option. So to begin with, we're looking at, at, at options which I'm familiar with especially when you're transitioning a livestock farm, um, you've got to be confident of, of what you're transitioning to uh, is you can perfect it. So hopefully with my current skill base, I will be able to perfect that. So um, yes, that's, so that's where we are with that one. Can I ask a quick question? What's going to happen September 2nd? Um, well, on, in September, um, I will officially become organic with the Soil Association. So, um, <laughs> can you see me? Yes, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I will um, come organic in September with the Soil Association, and then I'm allowed, I'm qualified to then start the biocyclic vegan standard transition plan, which is basically it allows a two year period to, to wind down my livestock which is I only have some, a small number of beef animals left, which I'm planning to do. And then um, I've got a five year grace period of allowing some of my forage sales to, as cash cropping. So um, that will help support the, the transition to, to the, the, the cereal enterprise. I hope that makes sense. Oh, and you're the first. Yes, I will be the first in, in, in the UK. Um, well, the, the biocyclic vegan standard, it, it allows for um, um, livestock farmers to transition. Um, they're, as I'm aware, they're the only um, organic body which allows organic, live, well, mixed livestock farms to transition. So with, without their support, I wouldn't be able to go down the organic cereal road. So I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm very grateful for them to take me on board. So this is how this is coming about. Wow. wow, very, very exactly. impressive. Uh, what you're doing is what we would like farmers and ranchers around the world to do. And uh, once we set up that template, then others can follow. Um, it, the hardest is to be the first. And so <laughs> you are um, doing something that will then create a record and that we others can review and follow in your footsteps. Thank you so much, Renee.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Rebecca. We'll be back uh, answering more questions and get more involved uh, in this fabulous groundbreaking discussion uh, regarding your farm. Next up, we have Helen Atto. Helen Atto has been someone on my radar for several years. And one of our board members, uh, Paul Berry, first told me about her. And I am so thrilled to, to introduce to you a woman that has been at this for, God, almost 40 years, I think. I mean, she's known as the goddess of veganic farming, and she's written manuals and, and books. Uh, she's, she's written grants. She is such an unspoken of hero. Helen Atto needs to be praised for the amazing work that she's doing. Helen, I can't do you justice. Please tell us everything you're doing and why in the world growing veganic is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And first, Lawrence, I want to tell you that uh, there is a huge demand for veganic grains. I am contacted regularly and I'm not a lot. We do small grains and, and uh, dried beans, but mainly we're uh, uh, fruit and vegetables. And I just don't have enough for the demand uh, that, that is out there for certified veganic grain. So keep it up. I guarantee you will have a market. And, and like you, I started out uh, in Montana. I grew up on, uh, on around cattle and uh, cattle ranching. And when I realized uh, what happened to those beautiful baby calves that we pulled when they were having trouble, when moms were having trouble calving, I, uh, I became a vegetarian and, uh, and I started farming organically, but I have to tell you that when I was in graduate school and when I worked for Montana State University, people didn't even think that we could do soil fertility and maintain the yields of conventional farmers because uh, nutrient cycling was, was such a challenge. And that became really easy for me. In fact, using manure-based compost, I had the terrible realization that I got too high a soil fertility in my, on my organic farm in the early 1990s. So- That was without, without animal inputs, right? Without animal oh, well, inputs. Excuse me, that was with animal inputs. So I said, oh. well, you know, I'm, I'm a vegetarian. I was becoming vegan. And let's see if I can farm without using manure-based compost and without using, uh, well, that was actually the only thing I was using. But of course, in certified organic farming, we use blood meal and bone meal and fish, excuse me, fish meal. So there were lots of animal products that were being used. So I tried to wean myself off and move to cover cropping and uh, had a living mulch system and it's taken 20 years, but now on our farm in Oregon, we semi-retired to a just small little place, 211 acres. And we, I'm, I'm being facetious because, because that's a lot to handle for horticultural crops. Yeah. And it's, not, it's, it's, it's not. The beautiful part is that a lot of it has been rewilded. But that being said, we have now been doing the soil science research to show that not only can we do veganic farming and have comparable yields to the certified organic yields that we had when we were using uh, manure-based compost and some of the higher nutrient fertilizers, but we found with other research that our system of growing our own fertilizer in place has allowed us to do both soil and habitat building so that we have such a strong biological control system that we have been able since about 2013 to stop spraying even certified organic management for, for insects and diseases. So we have gotten as close to a, a closed system, no off farm input, farming, ecological farming, as we ever hoped we could do, with still on many crops as good a yields as when we were uh, certified organic. 
Wow, that's incredible. This is unbelievable. And this is the most important conversation of our lifetimes. Again, we're trying to answer the question, how can farmers thrive on their land without using animals? You've heard already from uh, some leaders in the field, also a farmer in the United Kingdom who is doing it now. He is in the process of transition. Legislation's an important part. I wanna go straight out to my friend, Judy Mancuso, the founder and president of Social Compassion and Legislation. Judy, you have legislation that you have in Sacramento right now. Remember, California, if it was its own nation, would be the fifth largest country in the world. What happens in California spreads to the rest of the world. Tell us what your legislation is to help farmers and ranchers transition from animal agriculture to plant-based agriculture. And I will mention that California is also America's largest dairy state, having surpassed Wisconsin a long time ago. Judy, take it away. Thank you, Jane, and thank you everyone uh, that's on this panel. Your work is incredible. It's so moving. And of course, Renee's video with Grace, unbelievable. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, so the legislation would create a grant program uh, for farmers that want to transition from animal agriculture to a plant-based uh, crop. And uh, there's so many benefits. Most everyone knows, uh, you know, what we're up against with the climate crisis. And we heard across the United States, California, how uh, farmers have such a hard time with transitioning uh, monetarily and to be able to bring a grant program to them. Uh, but I will tell you that we ran into a lot of opposition from, uh, well, I have the letter in front of me, California Farm Bureau, California League of Food Producers, California Poultry Federation, Agriculture Energy Consumers Association, um, Association of California Egg Farmers, Pacific Egg and Poultry, and uh, Milk Producers Council, California Dairy Council, and the Dairy Farmers of America Western Area. And what they had to say was that the bill was discriminating, that if we create a grant program, it should go uh, to farmers that want to transition from uh, beef to dairy if they want it. And we said, well, that negates the whole purpose. So uh, yes, we introduced this bill. Yes, and it's an enormous fight. All the animal ag came after us, uh, but the bill is still alive. It comes back up in January. We made it what's called a two-year bill so that we could uh, work on the issue, get more support. And the one thing we desperately need is farmers in California who would like to transition that will step up and uh, be a part of the process with us. Extraordinary. Thank you, Judy. And if anybody is a farmer or knows a farmer who wants to transition in California, contact socialcompassionandlegislation.org because then you can join all of us going up there to testify and to make the point that, see, a lot of these farmers are afraid. Just address that very quickly, Judy. They're afraid to come out because they fear being blackballed. Yeah, I mean, if they raise their hand, hey, I'd love to transition, but yet the bill doesn't make it or it takes time, then there's retaliation uh, from these powerful ag, uh, you know, dairy and beef people. So most of the farmers are quiet. They would like to transition, but they don't wanna be public about it. Renee, you were gonna ask something? Oh, I was just, all I was gonna do was say just how incredible your work is, how grateful I am that you are on the right side of history and anything we can do to help support you, I'm in your court all the way. And next up, well, if, you know, if it's for, thank next you. Up, yeah, next up, if we could just keep moving along, we have Nicole Rosa Marino. Nicole is with uh, Southern Plains Land Trust. 
She's a PhD and she has been actively involved in her efforts to protect prairie wildlife since 1994. And I started talking to Nicole Rosa Marino a few years ago when Greg Lydas, uh, one of our RAP advisors introduced me to her because we were really struggling with what to do with cows you know, whenever they exit the food system. And Nicole has thousands upon thousands of acres uh, in Colorado that she's uh, acquired through land trust. And she's got buffalo there. She's been able to do so much on that land. And we're trying to figure out with our rancher advocacy program, how to attain that kind of land. And we would just love to engage your mind, Nicole, Tell us, tell us how you might help us make those types of, 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 of roadways. How do we get there? How do we, you know, find ways to get the land set aside for our farmers in transition? Thank you, Nicole. Well, thank you, Renee and Jane, uh, for this RAP Summit. I'm really excited to be a part of it, and I've really enjoyed our conversations, Renee. And I hope my uh, internet is okay. Um, I am uh, zooming in uh, from South, great, from Southeast Colorado, um, right next to our largest preserve, uh, the Southern Plains Land Trust's Heartland Ranch Nature Preserve. Uh, we started uh, over 20 years ago with um, just a 1,280 acre preserve that uh, we, we bought the land uh, from a rancher, um, no cows allowed on that property. Uh, absolute bright line against any wildlife killing. And we named it Fresh Tracks Nature Preserve uh, in honor of the uh, fresh wildlife tracks we saw in the snow on our first visit. Uh, fast forward to now, um, we have 32,000 acres uh, in our preserve network. Uh, and our largest is Heartland Ranch Nature Preserve, which is about 25,000 acres, which is 40 square miles. To put that in perspective, um, it's larger than any one of Colorado's state parks, uh, several national parks, and even five countries. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we have a country scale and certainly landscape scale uh, property um, that really, I think in this conversation, it's about transitioning the land from animal agriculture into um, something else. And for us, it's a wildlife preserve. We're trying to restore the American Serengeti in the Southern Plains where we work is considered flyover country. I, uh, you know, most Americans don't identify with it as an exciting place, uh, but in the mid 1800s, Europeans were streaming to the Great Plains because of the extraordinary bounty and variety of wildlife here. Um, Renee mentioned bison, they are our US national mammal, a fantastically charismatic, animal that is absolutely at home um, on the Great Plains. And so we've, we've returned them to the Great Plains. Um, and to get to your question, Renee, about, about how to do this, um, we partnered with a grant maker, um, the Summerlee Foundation, uh, and they had rescued longhorn cattle, uh, horses, uh, donkeys, and bison. Um, and they are re they've rehomed all of those animals um, but they brought us the bison and the longhorn cattle. Uh, and these are non-breeding herds um, that are living their lives in sanctuary. The, the bison aren't breeding because they're not genetically pure and therefore don't, don't serve conservation. But uh, we have since introduced a separate herd of, of conservation bison to recover that species, which is imperiled. I won't get, get into that. Um, can I ask but you, the can longhorn I ask you cattle a right here. Let me, let me ask you a quick question right here because I have right now somebody I'm working with, I've been networking all over the country, about 13 longhorn steer that are needing rehomed. They're, they're from a dude ranch, uh, actually in uh, Nebraska. And this woman is beside herself. She's a former cattle rancher and she's looking for a home. I mean, can, how, what would you do if somebody, uh, you know, asked you if you could rehome, they could rehome 13 longhorn there, is that possible? So um, we, we do have a process because um, we are a small organization and we have to be around forever because our obligations to protect the land and the wildlife are permanent. Um, this is not a 5, 10, 20 year obligation. This is 
permanent. Um, and both Rebecca and Helen uh, mentioned rewilding. We are part of a global rewilding effort. Um, and so uh, what we would do, Renee, um, is, to, is certainly have the conversation. Uh, the way that rescued animals have come to us in the past um, is they come with some funding for land acquisition. Um, and if we do it that way, uh, we have this wonderful hybrid model where we're, we're both rescuing uh, domestic animals and we're making possible um, this landscape scale protection for wildlife because wildlife need to be a part of the conversation. Um, yes. They need places that are absolutely safe. And you know, one of the wildlife species we protect is prairie dogs. Um, they have been reduced by 98% um, over the past century and a half and they're keystone species. And so that's affected hundreds of vertebrate wildlife species. And so what we do when we take on a rescue domestic animals is um, we have funding uh, come alongside that it could be from the person that wants to give them up or it could be uh, from a philanthropic organization or a partner animal protection organization. We're having conversations with some partner animal protection organizations right now about that. So uh, yes, it's a possibility. Yeah, remember, Happy to talk with you anytime. I remember we talked about this. I remember we talked about this. Hang on one second, Jane. I remember we talked about this a few years ago because we had several hundred cows we were trying to figure out what to do with. And I remember that the number was unbelievable of what, because cows live 20 years, their life expectancy. And so thank you for your work. Thank you so, so much for your work. Jane, you had to say something to say, I'm sorry. Point out to people who may not be aware is one of the key reasons we have to transition from animal agriculture to plant agriculture globally to survive is that approximately half of all ice-free land is used in some way, shape, or form for animal agriculture. And that means those forests, the wilding that Nicole's talking about, no longer exist. Trees absorb carbon. So by removing all the trees from approximately half of all ice-free land, what we've done is allow the temperature to rise. And the way we can immediately begin to reverse the temperature of the earth, which is hitting records right now, today, is to reforest. That is why it's so important for farmers and ranchers to transition. That's the heart of the matter. I know you have a very yeah. special guest coming up now. So I'll give it back to you, Renee, introduce her. Thank you so, so much, Jane. Yes, we have our next guest that uh, comes to us all the way from Austin. She is, she operates the only black owned farm within the Austin city limits. An amazing woman. I've had the opportunity to get to know her, uh, her work. Before I ever contacted Tiffany, I, I did my research on her and I could not believe that this incredible human being was an hour from Rowdy Girl Sanctuary. She is a trailblazer. She is, um, she is a, a descendant of black freedmen farmers whose agricultural traditions were dependent upon since the inception of Austin, Texas. Girl, I tell you what, I can't tell you how so very, very happy I am to have you here. Would you, you know, you have great insight into what farmers and ranchers can produce without animals because you're doing it. You're doing yes. it right now. How would you inspire other farmers to do what you're doing? Um, I would just say we need to, we need to make the connections because I'm hearing everybody and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, I do this on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in my community, I have a small scale urban farm It's about one and a quarter acres. And so I'm not able to grow a lot of food, but my goal is to help the environment and help the climate by recreating revitalized spaces and, um, forest spaces. So I'm going to try to create this food forest in, alongside my farm, um, and I utilize local food waste. I mean, there's just so many other things that we could use outside of just, you know, animal byproducts when it comes to our compost and, you know, especially inside our urban centers, inside of our cities. So when I'm hearing everybody talk about this stuff, I'm just like, 
we have to start having these types of conversations and we have to start meeting each other and just you know, sharing these ideas and resources so we can do the work that, that we all know needs to be done. So I just I just tell you guys, you know, if you're out there and you have enough land and, and you're turning to plant based or whatever, and you can help support my farm by being a bridge and helping to get produce out into the communities because a lot of our produce goes to restaurants and a lot of the restaurants aren't vegan restaurants you know so to be able to have those connections and get this food out to the community where it needs to go i think is 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 an amazing opportunity and we should all just be working together to make it happen thank you thank you so you're, so you're muted, much Jane. tiffany Let me get back. quick follow-up um, I just want to ask you, because we have to think outside the box, and that's something you did. Uh, nobody thinks really of a farm inside a city. You're doing it. Also using very little land to produce a lot of food. And um, so what we're thinking about here is marrying those folks, especially folks in the inner city who often live in what's yeah. called food deserts, with right. farmers who want to yeah. do something different. And so connecting those two. Can you just elaborate a little bit on how we can connect those two? Because during the pandemic, I started ordering vegetables delivered direct to me. It's been life-changing. I've taken off some weight. I'm eating more whole food plant-based. And I was thrilled. I would love, for example, to have an organic, veganic, organic, veganic vegetable and fruit delivery service. That would be the bomb. So, you know, there's a market right there that maybe some farmers and ranchers can can take yeah. because nobody's let, doing it. Let me just say, let me segue right there because you hit on it. We talked about this, Tiffany, because Tiffany's, she's not vegan yet, but I know that she and I talked about it and we talked about how cool it would be for her to actually make veganic soil and become a hub in this rural, rural urban community so that folks can buy this dirt because dirt is heavy and it's hard to ship it. You could really help the community around Austin and the other outlying areas so much by learning to make veganic dirt. Tiffany, what say you about that? I think that that's a great idea and it's an amazing opportunity. Um, and and we have to get we have to seek out food producers because it might not necessarily be a farmer it may be a market gardener it may be those guys who are holding down our community gardens within our communities who want to access these resources to help grow more produce so when we start to to come together as food producers especially vegetable growers um the word is just like word of mouth and it just kind of spreads and then that's how I'm able to meet women like Rebecca you know and Nicole and Renee and be able to say you know Renee if you're out there and you got a buku ton of, of veganic soil bring it out you know I can there's so many things I can do with it we can take it to the schools and put it into the school <laughs> gardens we can take it to the rec centers and put it in the rec gardens so it's so many things that we can do and it's just about Renee just called my phone. It was on a it was on a random day. I was talking to my husband and she just called me up and was like, hey, you don't know me, but I would love to talk. And that was just the start of a relationship. So I, I think we just need to build the relationships that create those marriages and those bridges um, so that the work can get done. I'm all about doing the work. <laughs> well, I am so glad you are. I'm so glad you are. And I, and I hope to, you know, meet you per face to face and inspire you to take the veganic route and go vegan yourself. Because girl, let me tell you something, there ain't nothing better. Once you make that decision as a farmer, <laughs> you will be amazed at, at the results. Something, Jane, you know, I don't think, think it'll be I don't think it would be too difficult because I mean, every day I'm out on the farm. So I'm walking, I'm taste testing and I'm doing this, bringing it home, you know, and it just, you know, it's something that's going to come natural. So Woo! <laughs> you heard it here guys on the rap summit. Hey, Jay, Dominic is here. I'm not sure if you want to go straight to the video or if you want to bring Dominic in after the video. Let's go to the video and then we'll bring Dominic in. If we can see him, it'd be great. Okay, go ahead. All right, let's roll, roll that video.
Meet Renee King Sonnen. After marrying a cattle rancher and moving to a farm in Engleton, Texas, she started to have feelings she had never experienced before. Hey, y'all, my name is Renee King Sonnen. And I'm her husband, Tommy Sonnen. Until a few years ago, we ran a ranch here in Texas. When our story about turning our cattle ranch into a sanctuary went viral, other farmers and ranchers started reaching out to us. They wanted to make a change too. But they needed to find another way to thrive on their land. That's where compassionate companies come in. A lot of companies are importing their ingredients from overseas. Why not get them from American farmers? That makes a lot more sense. With our rancher advocacy program, we're looking to match farmers with companies that need plant-based ingredients for their products. So, if you're a company looking to source plant-based ingredients for food, fashion, packaging, or anything really, we'd like you to reach out to us. It could be you're looking for fava beans, peas, nuts, or grains for a food product. Or you need pineapple or hemp for clothing or vegan leather, or mushrooms for packaging. Or maybe you're looking for an ingredient or raw material that we haven't even thought of yet. Our Rancher Advocacy Program is all about making connections and exploring possibilities to help farmers, consumers, animals, and the planet. So contact us. The time is now. There's never been a better time. Together, we can create better products and make a better world. Wonderful. We like to thank Susan Rosenzweig, who's also in Austin, uh, for making that video for the Rancher Advocacy Program Summit. Um, Renee, I know we're going to be talking to Dom. Uh, what would you say to anybody watching out there who wants to get involved? Well, Jane, the reason we did these two PSAs was because we wanted farmers and plant-based industry to come together, like peanut butter and chocolate. We see that the farmers that want to transition are vital and plant-based industries need farmers. Why would you outsource your ingredients when you can help farmers change the planet? So plant-based industries out there, if you've got a plant-based food product, let's partner with farmers that want to change. And then what we can do is bring in the investor models the green investors, the impact investors that want to also make this change. Jane, back to you. All right. I think we're going to introduce Don Thompson. Dominic Thompson uh, has created Eat What Elephants Eat Nutrition and Wellness Program. It is changing lives. I was on his website and people are saying, this is a miracle. It changed my life. Plant-based food coaches, me meal plans, and direct grocery delivery. So Dom, what would you say to transitioning farmers uh, in order to connect them with this exploding consumer market of people who are literally hungry for nutritious, delicious, plant-based food? Dom. You, you, you guys are right. I mean, you ladies are right. There's such an explosion and a demand uh, that we can't even keep up almost in many capacities, which is a beautiful thing because people do want to eat more plant-based, even if they're not technically vegan or vegetarian, uh, most people are taking more of the reducitarian approach. At least that's what we're seeing in studies. And that's also what we're seeing with our, our demographics specifically. We have over 10,000 subscribers and continue to grow every day with respect to people, how we wow. teach them how to eat plant-based specifically. Uh, we have a team of RDs and food coaches that really dive into your meal planning when you go through your onboarding process it takes five to ten minutes uh, for you to learn how to eat specifically uh, plant-based with our team we have an incredible team uh, it's a pretty award-winning team to the point now where we've been in talks with emory university to present this to different hospitals uh, in terms of the business model uh, we also met with the city of atlanta that's where we're primarily based what we're going to be doing i think Re renee your program is amazing and you and i Definitely need to talk further about that, but we're, uh, we already met with the city of Atlanta. As you guys know, politics is politics. So there's some pushback and there's some challenges now with the new administration leaving um, and a different old guard coming, but uh, Atlanta is trying to grow the urban farming space specifically, uh, but there is a lot of red tape. There is a lot of knocking on the doors. It's just taking a little bit of, of a longer process because 
where we're launching uh, next year, uh, we're going to do, we plan on acquiring some urban farms as well as a major farm where we're going to do truly uh, food to the table and open up a bunch of uh, juice and smoothie bars. We're going to open up some veganic awesome. uh, in the city of Atlanta. Uh, and that's going to be a really incredible process because we're going to teach locals a new uh, farm skill set while serving the underserved community uh, and be the biggest customers of that, uh, of our farms to source directly to the juice and smoothie bars. And we're also going to do that with our restaurant. Our first vegan restaurant is launching next year. So I'm really excited about that uh, as well. Uh, but the demand is there. Uh, the space is there. A lot of the problem is, is just really the capital and the resources uh, because there's only so much you can do uh, in different smaller business model spaces like that. But I'm really excited about the future because so many people are really ready, really ready to take on uh, eating plant-based more. Wow. Hey, Dominic, how would you, how would you inspire Tiffany Washington right now in urban Boston? How would you inspire her? Because God, I mean, I think the two of you should get together and talk. I, I wouldn't define it as inspire her. I, I would just say that maybe her and I can connect. Uh, you know, it sounds like she's already inspired herself, but I would love to connect with Tiffany and just explain to her my why or what I do, what I do and how I did that. And it's really up to her to take that, those components um, and, and process if that's what she wants to also adopt the part of her lifestyle, her business model, her personal journey specifically. Uh, just for the record, Tiffany, I stopped eating meat 21 years ago in federal prison. Uh, I'm from originally the west side of Chicago, former gang member and drug dealer, and I turned my life around in prison, uh, but it was there that I created a mantra, if it requires harm, then all, and that comes to everything from putting poison back into my community with respect to drug dealing to also being a customer to support a very outdated business model, food agriculture, animal agriculture, where we're destroying over 70 billion animals per year. And I didn't want to have anything to do a part of that. And I know a lot of vegans don't talk about this, but I got to be honest with you, not only did it do a transformation with my body, but spiritually and karma and energy and just a peace of mind. Uh, and I don't know if you're religious or spiritual, but it was the best decision of my life where everything just turned around 180 and just opened up so many different doors for me, opened up so many different sources of energy and different views on life itself, where it's just been the best decision of my life. And I can only speak for myself, but hopefully you and I can connect organically and maybe, or anyone that's listening, just, just Tiffany, but anyone, that's yeah, listening, uh, maybe want to just take a more deep dive into that because truly it is one of the best decisions. I think most human beings, especially in the Western culture that are privileged can make with their lives. Wow, how, how beautiful and extraordinary. And I'll just throw in, I went vegan after getting sober 26 years ago. So uh, there is a connection between having a moment of clarity and realizing that, wow, our actions are not in alignment with our values. Let's make it happen. Dom, I hope that some transitioning farmers in Atlanta, which is the new Hollywood, reach out to you because I've been to Atlanta many times. And let me tell you, if it wasn't for the vegan soul food restaurant in the Highlands, I would have starved. <laughs> I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about. You, you are exactly right. This is the second Hollywood, if not, it's becoming the number one Hollywood and also the New York of the East now, the Southeast. Everything is just crazy here in Atlanta now. And we don't have enough restaurants. And, you know, hopefully we can build that uh, ecosystem here in Atlanta because we don't. We don't have enough compared to the other markets, but we're coming. We're, hopefully there's better opportunities out there for sure. So, you know, what we're exploring and figuring out is there's a market. There's a market of people who are literally hungry. We just need these farmers and the government as well to start giving what the people want. And um, it's turning that that ship around is very hard. Uh, we What we don't want to do is rearrange deck chairs on the Titanic. And that brings me to my next guest. He is my hero. I met him at the Rowdy Girl Sanctuary in Texas. And Renee, you had a big event festival with great vegan food. Everybody was having a good time. And this guy got up and started talking. And frankly, we were going live for Jane Unchained, but not that many people were listening because they were having a great time. And he 
gave a speech that blew my mind. He said, we have to create a vegan world. We have to do it by 2026. We know why we have to do it. We know when we have to do it by. All we have to figure out is how we're going to do it. It was extraordinary because nobody had ever articulated verbally. And how can you achieve a goal if you can't even have the gumption to speak about it? Um, Renee, I think we should roll the videotape of the documentary that we did. Uh, but first, tell us about your experience with Dr. Rao. I, I, I just love it that you two met in Texas and Angleton, because I remember when you were listening to him and we were kind of like on the sidelines, you had your selfie stick and you said, by 2026? What, did I hear that right? And I said, yes, Jane, I had heard him somewhere and I'd already been, you know, I'd already become convinced. And you were like, oh, I got to hear more about this, you know, and you just started ignoring me completely. And it was all about Dr. Rao. And since then, you two have taken off to change the world. And, and you know, and I am so glad to just be in the midst of it all. Thank well, you. I ended up doing a documentary with the amazing Jeff Adams, the vegan linked on Dr. Rao and his mission uh, and strategy to create a vegan world by 2026. Roll the videotape. The moral position is to resist this and to end it. People need to know that this is the reality. What the problem? So we have a system that's based on you know making money off death, disease, and destruction. It's something that we have never ever faced before. The, the trees are going up in flames. We have 10 years to turn it around. The Earth is telling us we have to change. Inside of here is my daughter. I want her to have a good planet to live on, not just a planet to live on, because this planet will survive us. This affects everything. That's the only way out that we have. That's the only way out where I see light. Yeah, that's the number one thing you can do to reduce climate change. And I totally recommend it. Yeah, it is historic. In 20, 30 years, you'll have all our friends hitting us up being like, yo, you're visionary. It is a fight against ignorance and apathy. Moin. And you can watch wow. it wow. on Amazon Prime. It is available for you to watch the entire documentary on Amazon Prime and I urge everybody to do so. Dr. Rao, what would you say to farmers and ranchers and the world at large about the urgent need to transition from animal agriculture to plant-based agriculture or some other source of income? Why is it in everybody's self-interest to do this, Dr. Rao? Uh, thank you so much, Jen. Thank you for this amazing introduction. Uh, it is in everybody's interest because we are all living on one single planet. It's the same planet that we are all on. And you know, when we use um, animals for anything, we are actually expanding our footprint. So overall, this is why veganic farming will have a much lower footprint than using animal products, you know, whether it is organic, even if you're doing organic vegan, but, uh, but it's not veganic, your footprint is higher. We need to do that. So now is the time for us to reduce our footprint and give land back to nature so that she can start healing. You know, if the world goes vegan, we can literally return 80% of the earth's surface back to nature. It's a little like, you know, uh, starting to take a whole food plant-based diet when you have diabetes. The diabetes heals. In the same way, the earth can heal if you let 80% of the earth's surface back to nature. So that, uh, to me, is the number one thing we should be doing now to address climate change, to address the biodiversity loss, to address all of the ecological problems that are happening. And the clock is ticking, as you said. And it is, 2026 is a very scientific deadline, or I call it a lifeline, that uh, we need to get there by then. Um, and we have no choice but to do it. Well... How are we going to do it, Renee? We've got to transition these farmers. We we do, and I tell you, I was when we were in Costa Rica, and you were filming that documentary, and we were tracking that entire mountain that was a beautiful forest. I got I got a big picture of what these farms could look like, 
you know, it's all about vision. Like Dr. Rao always says, we have to not fight the system, but create a system so compelling, so beautiful, so wonderful that people will flock to it. And so those of us that are here are responsible for, for getting together and creating these systems. So I really do think that's how we do it. We, we, we come together, we band together, we have committees, we, 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 we work together in pods and we create this pathway. So that's what we do. We are now gonna open it up to all the patient panelists who've given their first statement, but let's start the conversation. People can ask other people. I wanna start it by going back to Judy Mancuso. We've made an argument that it is in the self-interest of everybody, individuals, companies, farmers, consumers, and the governments who are grappling with climate change to transition to plant-based. And yet the governments are the biggest obstacle. Let's face it, private companies are switching to plant-based. Even the, even the slaughtering companies and the meat killing companies are coming up with plant-based alternatives. JBS, one of the largest, if not the largest meat producer in the world has a vegan product line. Tyson has invested in meat alternatives on and on and on. It's the US government and other governments, including the United Nations that are just not getting on board with this, Judy. What can we do? It's all about the special interest that's been around since the very beginning. The Farm Bureau is the oldest, one of the oldest lobbies uh, in the state of California, for instance, and they are in the United States, and they call the shots. They have been given money to the politicians since the beginning of time. They're one of the largest contributors to their campaigns. So one of the things that we have to do, and so many people don't like to do it, but they have to, is to speak to their representatives, give campaign contributions. We started a PAC called Compassion PAC, and you can find it at CompassionPAC.org. And what it is for specifically is to give campaign contributions to politicians who will support these efforts, who will go against the status quo. So we need people to take politics very seriously and be a part of that system too, because we need it to grow this movement and to get government money to subsidize. These industries have been taking taxpayer money since the beginning of time. It is time to shift that paradigm. Wow. Thank you. Who would like to join in and, and offer a solution right now? Let's get the conversation going. Unmute yourself. Nicole. Yeah, you know, so I, I really love Judy's thoughts and work on um, grant programs um, that are going to you know foster this transition and Dr. Rao's um, underscoring the urgency and the global nature of the impacts. And I think there are opportunities um, for this work to proceed right now by linking in to two um, dynamics in particular. One is the carbon market. Um, our grasslands are enrolled in the carbon market because grasslands are extraordinary for sequestering carbon and helping to safeguard the life of our planet along with other ecosystems. And that brings me to the other dynamic, which is the call uh, for 30 by 30, protection of 30% of the Earth's ecosystems by 2030. And it really is a stepping stone to protecting half of Earth, um, as uh, E.O. Wilson recommended over a decade ago, um, for biodiversity and to mitigate against climate change. So I think if the transitioning farmers and their partners, all of you, um, really have these land-based solutions like ours, go out and buy the land, protect it for wildlife. And you know we have that hybrid rescued animal component. There really is an opportunity right now, given these conversations that are happening across the planet. And I, I, I think we'd be, be well served to link in with them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Nicole. And if we could, if we could just briefly bring uh, Helen Atto up, there is a question, uh, you know, from our audience about uh, Helen. 
So, uh, Helen, we understand that you've helped lead the organic farming revolution in the 70s and 80s. And there's a question out there uh, that maybe you could offer ideas on how veganic farming can be the next revolution. Can you shed some light on that? Oh, good. I'm so glad you asked because I, I wanted to jump in here. Uh, so I'm going to just start with what I was thinking. Uh, there are two yeah. legislative areas that I think we can all be uh, very involved in. One is the next farm bill. When we talk about the farm bill, we also talk about conservation and we talk about money for conservation. We need to all be making sure that our representatives know that the farm bill needs to be heavily weighed towards conservation and fertility systems right now Regenerative agriculture with animals has the ear of most of the representatives. That's the way it is. We've got to change that. And one of the ways is to talk about plant-based fertility systems in, in the terms of, of no-till, because no-till minimum soil disturbance right now is also uh, on everybody's mind. It's, it's an area that we can go through easily. So if we said, one simple thing in the farm bill that we need to be pushing cover crops, that every field in America should have a cover crop personally, I think every year, but, but one in three years, one in four years, that would change people's movement towards a plant-based soil fertility system. Then another legislative area is urban, suburban, statewide. When we had our uh, long-term organic veganic orchard in California, it was very easy for us to get comp composted yard waste because California has legislation that does not allow yard waste to go to the landfill. So simple. So then composting companies were getting that yard waste and compost is available for urban areas that is all plant-based. And we were able to purchase it as farmers very reasonably. And it takes a little bit to learn how to use composted yard waste if you're used to higher nitrogen nutrient materials. But just that legislation can make the basis so we can have a veganic revolution. And people maybe won't even realize that it's happening. <laughs> I, I just want to say a couple of things. One, uh, the more I learn about veganic <clears throat> soil, veganic, uh, the idea here I am a vegan, but the food I'm eating is from a uh, soil that has cow manure <laughs> and chicken feathers and everything else. Yeah. Oh, I want vegan <laughs> the market. Whoever comes up with this veganic soil, you are going to make money because I know there's a hundreds of thousands of vegans just like me who would want to have food that is completely vegan. And that would be food grown in veganic soil. Number one. Number two, I want to say that the whole scam is what I'll call it of regenerative agriculture um, <laughs> is a very, very um easy to dispute in the sense that it's basically saying you need to have all these cows and the cattle on the dirt and that they're going to hit the ground and um, reverse climate change or mitigate climate change with their hooves much as the bison in ancient times roamed. Well, um, there, it's been debunked. First of all, it was an idea that came from Alan Savory, who has admitted in his own TED talk that he killed 40,000 elephants when he thought that Elephants were the problem and had them wiped out, 40,000 elephants, and he doesn't deny it. Okay, so right there. Wait a minute, wait a minute, because I hear what you're saying, but we have to realize that regenerative farming can be veganic. So exactly. regenerative farming and in I, and of is itself is not, wait a minute, it's not the scam. It is regenerative farming using animals. Right. But That's if we can teach folks to regenerate land using veganic standards, uh, permaculture standards, and figure out how to save animals too in the same process like Nicole is talking about, 
and also Helen, this is the solution. This is where we need to be imploring our each other and creating a way out. Thank you. I understand what you're saying, but all I'm saying is when you hear the words regenerative agriculture in common culture today, it's animal agriculture. It's synonymous with yeah. that. There's tons of clubhouses talking about regenerative agriculture. Like you More always say, Jay, we got to reframe the debate. We got to frame the debate. So we got to change that. Right. For sure. Yeah. I agree 100%. I think... I think that we have to be, I think that we have to be very careful about the, about the conversation that we attach to the language that is being used today when it comes to any form of agriculture, because mm -hmm. y'all kind of taking me fast and quick. And, and I'm, that's just coming as a black farmer who is first of all, fighting to even be able to go back to farming and it not be a sense of enslavement or anything like that. So me just getting back to the land, the first thing I'm gonna wanna do is, is deal with livestock or animals. You know what I'm saying? So that, that does not necessarily mean that my goal is to slaughter the animals or anything like that, but it would be to raise cattle or have horses or anything like that. Now, when we, when we talk about regenerative agriculture, I don't, I don't automatically think that when I hear that term in our culture, for me, it's what are we doing to add organic matters and nutrients and those biodiversity um, practices to the soil to regenerate it. So for me, if, even if you're not going to eat it, even on your sanctuary, your cattle is roaming around and they're leaving their manure, which is being turned back over into the soil, which is, you know, you're not, you're not farming over there, you okay. know, but your, but well, your we land have is. We have an organic garden, but it's, you're right. Tiffany, yeah. You're so, right. I mean, even in the wild, even out in nature, even elephants out in the jungle, when they poop and it's left there, it becomes a part of the, the ecosystem in the forest. So we don't want to, when we have to be careful how we separate these things when we talk about what's in our foods. So for me, this is something that I do naturally. It, it's just normal to me to compost food waste because our cities are so full of food waste that there's nothing else you can do with it but compost it. So what are our compost facilities and recycling facilities doing with that compost or that waste? Like a lot of that processed food goes to the livestock. Like our, our Central Texas Food Bank, they send out their waste to livestock farmers. Those, the livestock can't eat that. That should go to farmers so that we can re-put it into the food system, compost it, put it back into our soil. I don't necessarily have to do that because I'm on a small farm. So I'm already naturally farming regeneratively or however you want to call it, whatever you want to use the language i'm already doing it naturally um Anthony, i want to jump in and just bring in dr silas rao again because you're talking about creating natural food forests dr rao and animals would be a part of that but they would be wild animals they wouldn't be animals who are forcibly bred into existence of which we have of whom we have 80 billion a year because right animals are destroying our planet uh, can you outline your ideal situation where uh, you would have a food forest, Dr. Rao? Unmute yourself. Thanks. Yeah, fundamentally, you know, we are transitioning from the old model, which is what we have been doing so far, into a new system, as Renee said. It's, we, are, we have to sort of think of this as a transition process, going from the old to the new. And in the new system, it'll be food forests, it'll be wild animals, and it'll be a few animals in sanctuaries because we are breeding an enormous amount of animals and we are actually creating them by ourselves. They're not having families by themselves, right? And, and they're also, they've also been genetically modified to just serve our purpose of just raising them to kill them, to eat them. So they, uh, like chickens, for instance, they, they grow so fast that uh, if a human baby grew at that rate, a one-year-old human baby would be 500 pounds. And, and a one-year-old uh, 500 pounds will not be able to survive on their own, okay? So that's how bad it is. So we are going from this grotesque system that we have 
to a new system. And then we need to look at all the resources we have, uh, we are deploying as a way to transition from the old to the new. And we need to put our politicians' feet to the fire saying, we cannot continue what we are doing now. It's not about continuing what we are doing now, continuing to grow the economy. This is the old language. We have to say, we are, we are going to have to transition by 2026. No ifs, ands, or buts. To me, that is such a hard deadline because at the rate at which we're killing wild animals, we are on track to wipe them out almost completely by 2026. So this is science. Yeah. And I'm just saying, you know, just looking at the numbers, you realize we are going to have to make this transition by that time. So then all the resources we have, I look at it as a five-year plan. What am I going to do with my resources over the next five years? Because I know that in 2026, what I have in the old model is going to be worth nothing. Okay. No matter how much I save here, it's going to be worth nothing because it's going to be a completely different model. Either it's going to be a completely different model or we're going to be dead. So that's the choice yeah. we face. Okay. We are, yeah. It's like we are driving a car and we round a bend on the highway and we see a huge concrete wall in front of us. We cannot say, oh, I love to put my foot on the accelerator, so I will never ever take my foot off it. If you do that, you're going to die. So you have to take your foot off the accelerator and put it on the brake, you know? So that's simple stuff. You know, I mean, we do that instinctively as human beings uh, when we see that situation in real life. But you know, now we're seeing it on a global scale, right? We're seeing it at, at the global scale and we need to do the same thing. Can I, can uh, I just say real quick, in just one moment, Salesh, I just wanted to say, you know, what you speak about is what I was wanting to explain maybe a little bit to Tiffany because it is so urgent. We don't have a lot of time to mess around. We really don't. We got to stop thinking we do. And a lot of the factory farms or most all the factory farms are where our organic compost comes from, those feedlots. Not people like you, Tiffany, that are, you know, raising, uh, making compost in, you know, your urban communities, but it comes from these feedlots. And so we've got to shut these factories down. And so anyway, that's what I had to say. Back to you, Jane. Oh yeah, Judy, jump in and unmute. Uh, well, I, I'm interested, Lawrence has actually shaken his head no. And I was wondering, go ahead, Lawrence. I was uh, gonna talk uh, about something. Regarding, regarding composting of CAFO systems, uh, 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 organic farmers aren't allowed to use um, um, waste from um, CAFO systems. But, well, in, in my country, we're not allowed to. Well, they so can that, in the United States, they do. They do in the United States. Oh, I didn't realize. Oh, yeah. We, oh, yes. yeah, we, we have higher standards. Yeah. So, uh, actually, that's, sorry, not, that's, not, that's not true uh, in, in, in US certification either. You, you, you can't use CAFO. Uh, it's, but we don't want to get into organic standards. But it is true that we want to consider how to not have manure concentrated in places. And we need to think about how to perennialize whether you're going to trees or not, whether you, how you perennialize so the soil is not disturbed by annual cropping. Wow, well, can I just jump in with one thing? There's something that's happening right now. Cory Booker, who is a US Senator and former presidential candidate who is vegan, has a bill that he is proposing in Congress to phase out factory farms. This is huge. And the reaction I've gotten is that, well, it's incredible, but there's no way it's gonna pass, which to me is so maddening. Finally, you have a US Senator who is vegan and he has talked to Kamala Harris, who has said when she visited a uh, vegan restaurant in Las Vegas that she's dabbling in veganism and trying to be vegan before six. So that's the vice president of the United States. Um, we have certain people in government waking up, even though the Biden administration put Tom Vilsack, who is the former head of a dairy trade group, so he is the meat industry, put him as the head of the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, but we have this bill, and yet um, there is a feeling that, oh my gosh, it's too radical. When, as Dr. Rao just said, we are barreling toward a brick wall Judy, quickly, you, you deal with legislation, jump in there. Well, 
you know, everybody has such a short term vision, the politicians. And so, you know, like I was saying, they've been taking money for so long from the special interests. They're so embedded in our government. So while Cory Booker, his intentions are good, it's he needs the votes. He needs the majority vote. And he's not going to get it because so many people are persuaded by big ag, meaning uh, meat and dairy. So that's where we all have to be activists. We all need to know who we're voting for and where they stand on these issues and be active. You know, our website, socialcompassionandlegislation.org, sign up for our uh, uh, support letters that we send. Uh, this is so important. You see the marches across the United States pre-COVID. You know, this is the kind of movement we have to have for, um, for our food systems, for uh, climate change. And it's always the last thing on the list or non-existent, you know, when, Al Gore did his movie 15 years ago or plus, uh, An Inconvenient Truth. He left out all ag farming, you know, and it was like, wait a second, how can you leave this out? And I had the opportunity to ask him that, and I did. And he said, well, you know, there was a lot of things left out we only had so much time for the documentary. And I was thinking, yes, but it's one of the most important things. So people don't wanna hear it. They don't wanna change what's on their plate, you know? And, and so you've got the money in the system, you've got people who don't wanna hear it and change, and it's up to us to make it happen and create a new status quo, if that makes sense. I so agree with you. I just want to jump in really quick and just say, too, we cannot hold all our or place all our energy and hope in these politicians that are just performative in so many ways. Vegan or not, a lot of them are performative. Uh, and I don't care if they're vegan, plant-based, or vegan before 6 p.m. Most of them, if not all of them, are performative. I cannot stress that enough. And we have to come together as a community and continue to do and come up with new solutions that we can do locally and just lead by example, because these politicians at the end of the day are mainly bought off and influenced by big industries. Well, I agree with you there. Um, and I mean, this is the, the, the farm bill, which uh, somebody brought up, is so important and it's going to be renewed or revisited or re, re-sent out in 2023. That's billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. And um, the Agriculture Fairness Alliance is another organization that is working to, to hire um, lobbyists to go into the halls of Congress and make our arguments that we're discussing right now to the staffers who often are the ones who actually write the legislation. And um, I was just talking to the head of the Agriculture Fairness Alliance yesterday, and she said, you know, a lot of the staffers are going plant-based or they know of people who are going plant-based. This plant-based movement that's happening across the United States is also happening in the halls of Congress amongst those who maybe are just paid by the hour. They're not necessarily uh, beholden as much as their bosses, the actual members of Congress, to uh, the largest lobbyists in the world, the pharmaceutical meat dairy industry. So um, I, it's a shame that this perfect solution um, is considered unrealistic. And let me say this, another good thing about this is that some environmental groups are jumping on because one of the biggest problems, just like you mentioned Al Gore, uh, not talking about animal agriculture, is that a lot of these so-called environmental groups completely ignore animal agriculture. They serve meat at their galas. But thanks to Joaquin Phoenix standing up at the Academy Awards, the SAG Awards, and the other awards and saying, hey, um, this is the, talking to the entire world and saying, the way we're treating animals is morally reprehensible. Some of those awards galas went vegan this in the past uh, when they were able to have galas prior to the pandemic. And it was a, a huge change. And that introduced 
environmental groups being held to account that, hey, if, if they can do it, these biggest award shows in the world, you can certainly do it. So I would like to go back to uh, Nicole Rosamarino. Do you see the environmental groups? You work with a lot of environmental groups, I'm sure. Are they making this transition to plant-based because some of them are supporting this bill? Yes, and I'm so glad you brought that up, Jane, because I've been in the environmental movement for 30 years in the US. I've been beating that same drum because I've been vegan that entire time. Um, you know, you might remember uh, the UN's report, Livestock Long Shadow, over 20 years ago, made the case that the livestock industry and climate change are inextricably linked. And so I am seeing that. Our own organization, Southern Plains Land Trust, only serves vegan at our events. Um, we're seeing that with, uh, with some of the big green groups. And so I do think that there is quite a lot of momentum. But uh, you know, one thing that I think would help is when we talk, um, you know, the folks at this RAP Summit, about the vegan diet being the perfect solution, um, we really, I think, need to regard that holistically. Um, organic standards were brought up. Um, Wild Farm Alliance is pushing for any organic farm that destroys native habitat to risk their organic standard. Um, maybe Helen can correct me if I got that wrong. You got it. Uh, but biodiversity protection needs to be part of um, the vegan diet. We need to you know, be mindful of the importance of rewilding and making sure there are protected spaces for the wild ones, particularly leading up to that deadline that I really hope Dr. Rao is right, <laughs> that we do this by 2026. Uh, um, but I think that um, the vegan movement um, could really foster that change, Jane, among the environmental community if, if, if we also talk about the environmental benefits and the need to look at vegan food production and make sure that that vegan food production is really helping on reducing the carbon footprint. It seems like a no brainer, and but it depends on the operation and rewilding and biodiversity goals. Absolutely. You know, I just want to quickly uh, bring up because y'all, I just saw, I, I have to say this because in, it, in, in this article, it says Texas based composter converts feedlot waste into organic fertilizer and soil amendments. These things may be changing in our government, but I know in Texas and I've heard it over and over and over that 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 does happen uh, in our in our uh, in our feedlots. So it may be changing, and this may be an old article, but I'd like to know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm fixing to dive into the research now because everything I have heard is our feedlots use compost for organic compost. I'm going to look into it, though, and I apologize if I was incorrect in that regard. Uh, my apologies, but I will do my research and find out if the laws have changed. Um, and also, I just want to quickly go to a question, if, if it's all right, because... Um, uh, we do have another question from, from Kelly out in the audience. She wants to know, she says, what do you say to farmers who claim that their lands can no longer be used for anything other than animal agriculture because nothing else can grow on it? And, you know, I think that is an excellent question. Jane, I'm sure you hear that as well in some of the rooms you host in Comod, because I've been in, in some rooms with you. Uh, what are some of the things you've heard? Well, let's go to Lawrence. I think Lawrence, being the farmer himself, is the perfect person to answer that question. But he's in the UK, and it's not going to be different. It's going to be different on all types of land. So I will also answer that question in just a moment. I was hoping that you might have heard some things. Um, but yeah, we can hear from Lawrence as far as the land in the UK, but there's Texas and Montana and California are all different. Yeah. Clubhouse, there's all these animal agriculture clubhouses where they're like, you have to use animals. You can't have land without the, land will deteriorate without animals. Can you bust that myth, Lawrence? Well, on, on marginal, marginal land in the UK, we, we, we have, we, well, we could, on, there's some marginal land on my farm. Um, we could look at, look at fruit trees, um, blackberries, um, apples, pears. Uh, there's lots of different options. There's nuts, uh, well, Rebecca will say, because she has one client in, in the Highlands that's growing nut trees on her croft. So there's, there are lots of options, but, but I do understand farmers, well, the marginal farmers, where they're coming from, they're, 
that they, 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 they're they basically, they're scared because they only know a certain way of doing something and to, to come about to a new and completely new system, that, that there's always going to be a, a reserve there um, of knowing is this the way forward. So it's, it's human nature, but there's certainly um, other options. And then there's, there's also carbon capture. We should, the government should introduce a fiscal policy to actually pay farmers to scrub carbon. We, we've got this res valuable resource, the soil. It's the largest carbon sink in the world and we can use it. So, so that, that's just, we've got to change the way politicians think and also how the market thinks. If we had carbon well, accounts- I love, what carbon. Rebecca, I love what Rebecca said a while ago, the three ways that y'all are, um, you know, you're answering this question. And I wanna to talk to you more about that, Rebecca. Can you please elaborate on what you tell your farmers uh, because you've done this research extensively? Yeah, so there's, there's many options for farmers who say all we can do is graze animals on this land. And one is the whole carbon capture thing. And we're lobbying the government right now for funding for farmers who want to rewild or restore ecosystems on land that's only been used for grazing in the past. And in America, actually, there's, a, there's an organization called Regen dot network mm -hmm. www.regen.network and what they're doing is incentivizing uh, ecological outcomes with farmers through uh, financing them to sequester carbon build soils clean waterways habitats and healthy food and the regen network actually provides funding for farmers to do this so this would be on land like you were talking about a minute ago where uh, previously it's only been deemed suitable for grazing a couple of other things we're doing is we're looking at marginal crops like hemp. You know, I know you had somebody on the second summit who talked about hemp. Hemp grows on marginal land. It's a climate change champ. It sequesters four times as much CO2 than trees. Uh, we can use it for food, clothing, fuel, shelter. And historically it was used for these things. So right now we've got 10 farmers in Aberdeenshire, which is very rural, mostly grassland who are actually growing hemp. The other one that I was talking about earlier is leaf protein concentrate, LIFU. And this is the potential to make protein for human consumption from grass and clover lays. Um, you can even make it from the weeds in your garden. So I've made it from my nettles in my garden and we've eaten it and it's great. Uh, so this can be made from potato leaves. This can be made from sugar beet leaves. This can be made from any leaves that are edible for, for humans? What do you, you going to add a question, Renee? So, yeah, what about the seeds on your website that you're also uh, farming, teaching folks to farm seaweed? Yep, uh, this is another option for coastal uh, farmers and crofters. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a kelp crofter uh, on the west coast of Scotland who is farming kelp. And we've since they started doing this, we've had another crofter come forward who has been a seafood farmer and wants to transition to farming kelp. And kelp is another climate change champ. It's basically like trees underground. So uh, there's, there's many, many options there. Um, and, and the other option is restoring the, the buildings, you know, like you talked about earlier. Yeah. I mean, farmers yeah. have these massive buildings. They could, you know, figure out ways to use those buildings to grow mushrooms or, or flowers or, or any number of crops. Absolutely. Repurposing oh, yeah. buildings is a big one. We have a farmer up here who used to have battery hens. Battery hens was very small cages. In fact, my grandfather was a battery hen farmer. It was made illegal in 2011 in the UK. And this former battery hen farmer has converted his massive building into this spotlessly clean storage space where people store their campers and their uh, caravans in the winter. And he's also turned it into a, a, a warehouse for shipping out used books. So there's so many ways that you can, you know, and, and he's on a farm where, you know, it would have just been grass other than that. So there's so many options to diversify. Um, you know, so many farmers have tremendous amounts of land. And I guess the ideal solution would be to be able to use a small portion of the land in a very profitable way. And there's also solar and wind there's a lot of things that can be done on that small piece of land and then rewild the rest. That would be the absolutely. solution. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we have a farmer we're working with. There's a picture. She's right there, Michelle, with the veg box. 
um, she, they had one, eight, and that's her husband, Robert, next to her with the, with the rototiller. Um, they had one acre of land, which they rented. And from that one acre of land, they were supplying 35, 36 hotels throughout Scotland with amazing microgreens and vegetables and making a living with just this one acre of land. And if you look at how much livestock you could have on one acre of land, you could have half a dairy cow on one acre of land, or you could have two thirds of a beef cow versus all this amazing food. And when the pandemic hit, they shifted from supplying hotels to supplying 150 veg boxes a week on one acre of land. You know, and, and in the UK, 85% of our arable land uh, sorry, 85% of our agricultural land is used for livestock and it's only producing 32% of our calories and only 15% uh, is used for growing crops for human consumption, producing 68% of our calories. So yes, we have enough arable land in this country and I know you do in the US to feed the entire population on a very small amount of land and then the rest can be used for sort of carbon capture uh, restoring forests. The climax vegetation of the UK is trees, so we can restore trees, we can restore the soil for what Helen's talking about, you know, is regenerative, regenerative vegan agriculture where we recycle the nutrients and the soil organic matter back into the soil in a closed loop system. You know, so uh, what's been said tonight, I agree with both, we need to lobby the government, but we also need to grow this movement out, you know, horizontally, this movement of small farmers, who are farming, I'm not going to say farming without animals, because that's a misconception. I'm going to say farming yeah. without yeah. livestock, because the land naturally has all these wild animals. The soil has worms and termites and nematodes, and we have, you know, geese that are grazers. And so, you know, we have the, the natural animals who recycle nutrients. You know, the irony of the regenerative agriculture, the livestock people, is it was livestock that took away all of nature. It was intensive farming that dis decimated our wildlife. And now they're saying we need the cows to bring it back. I mean, it's absolutely twisted. Uh, what we need is to get rid of the livestock and let the earth regenerate itself and let these animals. You know, there's a wonderful article by Nassim Nobari, and I know Helen knows Nassim, and it's called uh, A Million Tiny Cows to Regenerate the Earth or something like that. It was in... Um, a magazine and it's brilliant um, and it talks about the work of Amir, Dr. Amir Kassan and he's saying you know we have a million tiny cows in the earth that were made to do this job of recycling nu nutrients and organic matter that, uh, that a grasshopper uh, eats more, more organic matter than a cow <laughs> you know and it does a better job so let's just let nature, you know, restore itself. Let's, let's get back to what we know. You know, you, you go to a forest and we don't say, oh, we need cows in the forest to make the forest better. The forest is doing it itself. It's recycling the nutrients. It's got the organic matter um, without humans messing with it, you know, and, and that <coughs> organic agriculture aims to do is, is to restore us back to nature, basically. Sorry, that I went yeah. on a bit of a rant there. Sorry about that. Lawrence wanted to jump in. Lawrence? No, Let's go. I, I was just, as a farmer, I was just going to comment about regenerative agriculture and the role of, uh, of cattle. The reason we've had, we have farmers argue for cattle is because it, refer, uh, it um, funds the regenerative phase. In my grandfather's day, traditional farming was an exploitive phase and a regenerative phase. That's how farming systems worked. Now, basically, in the regenerative phase, we, we, we sow grass and clover lays. And then in order to gain an income, we use um, ruminants to, to graze the grass to provide us with cash flow. That's, that's why these regenerative, get, like Gabe Brown, support that system, because it, it's giving them a, a cash source, which is, after all, it is a business. Farmers do need a source of income. But there is another way, and, and of course, it is through fiscal intervention. We just pay the farmers to grow these green manures, incorporate them into the soil. We need to regenerate our soils. There's, there's this uh, bit of a misnomer to think we can take away 80% of the land. You, yes, well, that 80% is for, for life, with livestock farming. But you've got to remember the, the other percentage, most of that soil it, it is, it needs regenerating. It's severely eroded. It needs to be taken out and rested. 
we need to take farmers yeah. on this commodity treadmill. And, it, and until we do that, then we're not going to get anywhere. So that's, so that's what we need to do. But that's the link between regenerative farming and livestock. Thank and let me, ask you, let me ask you, Lawrence, how many cows do you have left? I have approximately 40. And 40 so beef stocks question, from little, little calves. To, you have, are, are they breeding still or? No, no, they're no, they're, they're stores. They're stores. They're stores. They're castrated. Okay, so, yeah. Good. Okay. And so the other question is: so do, have you been having conversations with sanctuaries about uh, no. the animals, or what? No, no. Is this this is the other. This is the other um, assumption that vegans assume that farmers can afford to donate their animals to a sanctuary. Unfortunately, I'm not in that situation, and I think um, people need to be make. Well, I know Rebecca feels strongly on this one. We we've got. We just can't afford to do it. We, we've got we, we've we've got our bills to pay. If if I go and donate my animals to um, a sanctuary, which I probably could, I'd get blacklisted by my bank, and I I wouldn't get the capital to 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 to, to, to evolve the business. So so it, we we've got to get away from that. Not everyone has that choice, and I, I think it's wrong to assume that every livestock yeah. farmer does. And so, you know what? You know, this is I'm glad you say. I'm glad you're bringing this up because vegans never vegans jumped my butt whenever I first went went live and vocal about buying my husband's cows back in 2015, you know, or 2014 when I went vegan. My husband was gonna we we're gonna get a divorce and he was gonna sell the herd and we were gonna get out of business, you know, because he owned the herd, he owned the land, and there was no way he could even think about you know anything else. Now he will tell you today, he said, man, he said, man, if I had it to do over again, I would have just given you those cows. I had to go live. I had to go public and raise the money to buy his then 30 cows from him to start a sanctuary. Because see, ethically, what happened to me, now, this is what happened. Ethically, I personally could not see those animals go into the food system. They had become, they had become like my dogs and cats. I started seeing them through a different pair of glasses. So I was, I was motivated with everything in me to figure out what I had to do to save them cows because my husband would have just sold them all. And I, and, and we wouldn't be having this conversation, frankly, had I done that. We wouldn't have the rancher advocacy program had I done that. And my, and my husband now says boldly, I wished I would have just given them to you. I think I think it's a good come up with if we could come up with forty thousand pounds to give Lawrence, you know, for his forty cows. More than, that. <laughs> yes. uh, more than that, you know, when, when you ask a farmer to give up their herd, you're asking them to give up, you know, three years' salary or their checking and savings account at the same time, and uh, it's a lot of money to raise and then to support the sanctuary that takes them. And you know what yeah, that's about, Renee. Yeah. And, and yeah. People maybe can have a little bit more compassion now for what you know what my husband had to do. It was freaking hard to do what we yeah. did. It, it, it put us through all kind of misery, you know? So I understand completely. Um, Rene, I've learned one thing in life. There is no compassion, <laughs> not from anyone, not from the consumer, not from the banks or big ag or anything. We, we live in a ruthless world. And I think people should realize that. Consumers say one thing, but do another. They demand cheap food. That's why we have CAFOs. And, and intensive farming. Um, I, I think people are, are being a bit misjudged on that one, but at the end of the day, I'm trapped. And, and, and Jane has said this, I, I'm glad she, she shows in, in the previous summits that farmers don't have choices. I, I have a legal charge over those animals. If, if I donated them away, I would have no access to any funding in the future, which I need. But I, I, I do understand where you're coming from. I per personally, I've been through tragedies myself. I, it was in the, Rebecca's interview. So I, I do understand, Renee, I, I, I admire you. And I'm, I'm pleased that there's, um, um, well, the rewilding going along to what's going to happen to, to, to accommodate these animals. But in, in England, it, it's just not possible because we don't have the, the area of land to do it or the resources. So, but in the US, things are different. But 
Yeah, yes, I have, you have my complete admiration. And, and that's, I'd like to say, and that's why we're trying to create this grant program. It is exactly for farmers like Lawrence that could use uh, the, some grant money to cover those cows so that he can get out from under and move on with his new, um, you know, with his new production. Uh, non-animal. It's not right. Uh, it's not right that, that farmers would, you know, that want to get out, have to sell their cows. We've we've got to figure this is the one piece that I constantly struggle with. Uh, you know, not everybody's going to be able to put their whole livelihood on the line and their marriage and everything. Um, you know, like I did, and and it and it and I just want to cry right now. Honestly, when I hear Lawrence talk about this, I totally understand, and I would hate to be in his shoes. Um, well, we've, it's, it's not, we've been subsidizing farmers to grow, uh, you know, milk and meat and they pour the milk out because there's too much, but yet we can't subsidize farmers uh, to, you know, retire 40 cows and transition to a new crop, crop where there is a, a demand for the supply that Lawrence uh, can create. So this is the thinking that we have to change on subsidies as well. It is okay to subsidize farmers. Let's subsidize them away from this. And, you know, I just, if I could take one second, this opposition letter we got from the uh, Big Ag Meat and Dairy is one of their main uh, arguments against our grant program that we want to give to these uh, plant-based farmers. They say dairy and livestock production beyond, and this is a bunch of BS, but beyond providing high protein, nutritious food sources for human consumption, help control wildfire risk from vegetative fuel loads in the environment promote biodiversity through suppression of non-native and noxious weed species, provide high quality fiber, which we know they don't, inputs for composting and biofuel, assist in the management of organic waste and agricultural byproducts, make valuable use of suboptimal non-prime agricultural lands and provide economic and job opportunities for tens of thousands of families and businesses that depend on thriving livestock and dairy sector. And they, that was their argument. And you guys just dispelled, dispelled some of it, but we need to dispel it all. And we need to make it common so that this line doesn't win at the end of the day. What, what yeah. we need to do is to get farmers and ranchers in California to come to Sacramento and testify and experts to debunk every single one of those lies. I'm going to call that an alternative fact, a lie. Um, it's the animal agriculture is creating the climate crisis. And now they're going through this whole PR move where they try to say that animal agriculture, whether it's the uh, animal regenerative agriculture movement or some other movement is solving it. Here's how sick our society has become. They are now suggesting and actually have a pilot program to put masks on cows so that not only are they tortured, they are forcibly impregnated, their babies are stolen from them and they're eventually killed. But now during their horrific, terrible lives, they're gonna have to wear masks, walk around with masks to, to take their uh, burps and that are methane filled and somehow, this is moral- it's too late for that. Good God. Moral degeneracy. And if you think about it in history, when great civilizations collapse, it is moral degeneracy. It happened in ancient Rome when the system becomes so corrupt that it does not serve the people, it serves only those in power, it will ultimately fail. So we are at a crucial juncture right now in time. And uh, the idea that a perfect solution, ending factory farms is a bill proposed by a US Senator that people consider it unrealistic because 
it actually targets the problem. That's a lack of imagination too. I'm not saying that strategy isn't important. And I understand why people would say that too far, too fast, but we're running out of time. We can Let me ask a question. Here. Let me ask you a question, Jane. You know, Dominic said a while ago, and he was right, you know, and Judy, you know, how, and, and, and Dr. Rao, we can't trust, how do we trust a corrupt system that has let us down time and time again? How do we trust a corrupt system that, that they're going to reform it? There, there's so many powers that be. It. Yeah, it's changed and it's making laws and but we need to be a part. We have to go toe to toe with the big ag. I mean, you see this list that has every uh, you know logo of big ag on it. We need globally letters with everybody's logo who's in this movement. If our voices overwhelm these voices, <coughs> we will be heard, but they have been organizing way before many of us went vegan. I'm going on being vegan 30 years, but they've been around since the 1800s as the largest lobby in the state. That's what's going to be so hard. I remember seeing our name, Rowdy Girl Sanctuary in the Rancher Advocacy Program, along with PETA and others, on some list that animal agriculture has as threats to their industry. I mean, we are considered threats, you know, and one of the problems we have as a movement is we, we are always got all this infighting crap going on. I mean, we need to, we got to put principles before personalities. If we're going to do this legally, we've got to be able to come together. Uh, and I don't know how we're going to do that because on one hand, I hear you. And on the other hand, I hear Dr. Rao when he says, we can't fight the system. We got to create a new one. So we have got to figure out how to create this new system. And a system, by the way, that doesn't have to send these, I mean, it, it just terrifies me and makes me sick to my stomach to think that cattle ranchers have to send their part, their animals to slaughter to transition. Ultimately, it makes me ultimately this is a consumer issue. Yes, yeah. None of it, these animals Yes, are Jane, up. Jane, this is every, every sorry for butting in. No. Um, this is everything to do with, the, it's cons, this is going to be consumer-led. It was a consumer problem, the, the, the demand for cheap animal products. That's just, this is the reason we're in the mess today, is because of consumer demand for cheap animal products and the supermarkets. I've spoken to lots of dairy processors in my lifetime uh, and, and meat processors, and they all say same, the same thing. The supermarkets, they just turn the screw, they just turn the screw into their to uh, literally down to one percent, we have one percent profit margins in this country from dairy processors now and meat processors. And how can you run businesses like that? But at the end of the day, it is up to cons consumers to educate themselves. Veganic, which I was on veganery teaching vegan, a livestock and uh, a beef and dairy farmer teaching vegans about their own agricultural system last Friday. So that says everything, doesn't it? So um. Um, we, we've got to educate the consumer. They've got to be able to identify sustainable farming systems, which is organic farming is the ultimate number one sustainable system. We have to get the, the, um, our governments on board. They have to start understanding agriculture. And time is running out. Yes, of course, um, uh, animal ag is the key driver of global warming. It's, 20, it's, it's the minimum of 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and, and it's going to increase. I was just reading yesterday that global dairy production is expected to increase by 17% this decade, principally from India and Pakistan. Beef production, 20% supposed to increase. And that's coming from- because Big companies are working with phony environmental groups giving animals. We must stop animal gifting because what yeah. happens is every time there is a red flag about a very profitable industry in the United States, let's think about tobacco. What did they do? Oh, tobacco became politically incorrect in the United States. They exported it to foreign countries. 
Now dairy is becoming politically incorrect in the United States. I just went to the grocery store and there's a new product that says not milk with a cow and a cross over it for with a, in a container. Milk is, cow's milk is becoming politically correct. So what are they doing? They're exporting it to India and China. They're trying to hook India and China on dairy. And in fact, China, um, which uh, invented tofu, which invented uh, faux meats, is now experiencing some of the same health problems that Americans experience uh, because they're, they're now gradually taking on the American diet of meat, dairy, and fast food. We are spreading this plague around the world. And so it's also human health crisis. Can I just throw Dr. Rao in here because he, he knows a lot about this being from India. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to just jump in and say that that is colonialism 101, what they're doing with the dairy, because 70% uh, of Indians are so-called lactose intolerant. I really call it lactose normal. You know, we, we cannot digest lactose. And yet dairy is being pushed on Indians. Dairy is being pushed on the Chinese who are even 80% or more lactose intolerant or lactose normal. You know, and so this is just colonialism, you know, making people eat food that's going to make them sick so that they can become customers for the pharmaceutical industry. So, so this is why India has become the diabetes capital of the world right now. Yeah, with this bad food being pushed on Indians. I mean, the fundamental diet of India was always vegan. You know, dal and chawal was vegan. I mean, dal, chawal, uh, roti, sabji, these are all vegan products that we were eating. This is our normal diet. And yet um, we have been pushed to consume more and more dairy this, and the government is in on it because the government is part of the same colonial system. So Lawrence is absolutely right. You have a ruthless system that is all about exploiting nature, animals, and people in order to make money for a few people. Ultimately, it only goes to a few people, okay? So when you have a ruthless system like that, which is based on foundational axioms that are false, so I say there are two, this is really a double Galileo moment in human history, okay? Galileo only, had to, Galileo only had to say that the sun does not go around the earth, the earth goes around the sun. And that ignited the scientific revolution, okay, in the 17th century. In the same way, now we have to overturn two axioms. One is the axiom of consumerism. Happiness does not come from consuming and from stoking and satisfying a never ending series of desires. That's what all these ads are all about. So we are stoked, we are steeped in a system that's based on the axiom of consumerism. And it's also based on the axiom of supremacism, which is that life is a competitive game in which those who have gained an advantage may possess, enslave, and exploit animals, nature, and the disadvantaged for their pursuit of happiness. That's the second axiom that the system is based on. This is the origin of the cruelty and the ruthlessness in the system these two axioms. And we bought into this. this. We are playing a game of money, which is you know, fundamentally built on these two axioms. And so- Can we? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I hear you, I hear you. And, and I, uh, these two axioms, name them, name the two axioms one by one right now. And I really wanna, I want Tiffany, Dominic, uh, and Nicole to weigh in on this because uh, I've been in the background watching some of the conversation going on in the chat, and there's some questions uh, that, you know, Tiffany and Dominic, uh, I think, can address, and also Nicole. So, Dr. Al, what are those two distinct axioms? The first one? is the axiom of the false axiom of consumerism, which is that um, um, the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by stoking and satisfying a never ending series of desires, which we know to be false. We have known that to be false for 10,000 years. You know, It's not like it's something new that I'm telling you, but we have a system that's built on that. The second is the false axiom of supremacism, which is that life is a competitive game in which those who have gained an advantage based on whatever, their skin color, their, their heritage, whatever it is, those who have gained an advantage may possess, enslave and exploit animals, nature, and the disadvantaged for their pursuit of happiness. So those are the two axioms that the system is built on. And we need to overturn them. 
So we need to create a new system based on the correct axioms. What are the correct axioms? The first is the axiom of inner peace, which is the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by seeking it within ourselves. We need to teach that to children. We need, we need that to be the foundation of the new system. And the second is the correct axiom of unity, which is that all life is one family in which we each bring our unique skills to give all we can, receive all we need and become all we are. And we and need to create- There isn't a better, way, and there isn't a better way to do that. And, and I'm just doing it in the interest of, of time. Right. There isn't a better way to do that than folks like Tiffany and Dominic that are working in local communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, local communities coming together, creating the change locally, right where we live, and bringing it outward. You know, how can we do this? Tiffany, uh, Dominic, what are your thoughts after listening to all this? And also, Helen, you too uh, are, are, are participating in a, in, a local, in a local fashion. I would love to hear your thoughts as we move towards the end. Ask Dominic... I want to ask Dominic a direct question. African-Americans are the fastest growing segment of the vegan uh, movement, which I've read several times and it's very thrilling. And also there is a move now, obviously, uh, to re review history. There's the Black Lives Matter movement. And while protests are great, leveraging one's pocketbook is perhaps the greatest way to harness political power. What would you say if communities of color um, decided we are going to boycott meat. In fact, in Iowa, Joe Enriquez Henry, who represents Latino, mostly Latino, but uh, people from 30 different countries, slaughterhouse workers who've been dying of COVID and getting hit by COVID and suffering in many ways. He started an organization called Boycott Meat. He didn't do it to be a vegan, but he's become a vegan. And he strongly advocates communities of color harnessing their dollars. If communities of color just pulled their fast food dollars, it would collapse the meat and dairy industry. What do you think of that movement, Dom? Uh, before I jump in, I don't wanna uh, jump ahead of Tiffany. Tiffany, did you wanna give input first before I jump in or you you wanna come out there? Uh, I, wanna give um, I do. Because when we talk about communities of color, we're talking about vulnerable and marginalized people. Um, they don't even have access to food. So we're talking about food deserts. So they don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables to even be vegans. So when we, when we talk about the, I'm, I'm, we have to be very careful about the things that we are talking about and in the people we're trying to pull into the conversation because I am a farmer. I'm a black farmer in the state of Texas in a city where farming for us was taken away purposely. So to, to be able to come back to agriculture, I don't, I don't look at all that animal farming and all of this different stuff for me, it's about being a part of nature. It's about taking care of the earth. It's about the climate and stuff like that. So if I have a small homestead or something like that, and I want to have some cows or whatever, that's what I'm going to do. If I want to have a section of my farm that is dedicated to growing plant-based things because I don't necessarily want to use manure-based compost, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, but to, to say... I don't think that that'll never happen. You'll never have one co a community of color just all together say, we're gonna go vegan. That's just not gonna happen because one, they don't have access to food and our, the way we eat, there's a culturally appropriate way to eat. And that even happens within veganism. I, I just believe so because you know I'm black and there's some things that I don't eat as far as vegetables, um, but as I think it's just, it's, this conversation is a very hard conversation because I feel like we're skipping over things. First of all, who are these farmers we're talking about? These big farmers, big pharma, big ag in the, in a, in the United States, those are all white men. Like they, who's farming? There's no people of color farming. So when we talk about 
doing all of this stuff. Of course, we can do it and we can make it happen. We need to bring in the new generation of farmers. We need to bring in farmers of color, the young people, these youth who are out here who already have these things planned out and want to accomplish them. They just don't have the access. And we are the access and we are the resources. So when we connect with our youth, allow their ideas to, to, to move forward and, and let all of this stuff come together. It's, it's just, it just seems like a lot of going at you with, we need to do it this way and it needs to be done like this. And we, yes, we dying right now today because black people don't got access to food period. So whether or not they got access to, to vegan restaurants, to me, that don't matter because they dying because they can't eat. So we need to be talking about growing food, period. And we need to be talking about creating the environment to do that because our environment with climate change and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's bad. It's hard to grow food, period, regardless of if you using cattle or you going plant-based. We're talking about taking farmers who are already vegetable farmers and telling them, okay, stop using manure, go plant-based. That's cool. It sounds good. We can do that. But what's that going to cost me? I got four kids. You know what I'm saying? So, but like I say, that's something that I already do every day. But those other farmers who are just getting into it, I feel like big ag is already dying. They like dinosaurs. They going into extinction. So we need to just let them die out and let this be more of a conversation that we're having on a regular basis and get through the hard parts of the conversations with each other. Cause I, I've been listening and I don't have a good poker face y'all because I'm not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a, you know, somebody that went to college and did all of this stuff. I'm just a regular chick from the east side of Austin, Texas that grew up in the hood that became a farmer. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so when I, when I have these conversations and even for, for Dominique out in Atlanta, I have a lot of friends. I have black farmer friends out there that's growing peanuts, watermelon, hemp. You know what I'm saying? I would love to connect you with them because you'll be able to see that the work is being done and it's nothing to make the tweaks in the work. But we don't want to make the tweaks seem like they have to be so extreme. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, that's just you that's know, just my take on one it. Up, one of the things you brought up, Tiffany, is that it just it's rattling in my ear that big ag is mostly, you know, the white men. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, it's amazing how I explode sometimes with truth. And I and I know that that's got to be true because I know the that the black uh, population has just been marginalized uh, in farming communities, period. And it is that way at the top. And I'm gonna be doing some more research on that now too. Thank you, thank you, uh, Tiffany. And you and I are gonna meet real soon on this. And Dominic. Yeah, it's a lot of information that Tiffany just said that I definitely mostly agree on without a doubt. That's what I wanted to get her to floor. Uh, like Tiffany, I don't have a poker face and I, I don't restrain myself. I'm a straight shooter too. Uh, and it's just not big agriculture, big farming that is mainly white men. It's the farming in general. Uh, if you guys do the history, you, you already know Americans history with giving a lot of white families the opportunity to do farming and pretty much didn't give any black families any opportunity. There's still a lot of different lawsuits and a lot of different all types of initiatives that are happening backdoor and publicly all because of that. And like every other thing in, in American history, when it comes to black families, we are all playing catch up in many capacities. Um, so I agree with Tiffany because it is it, it, like Tiffany, it angers me to hear these solutions, uh, these wants, these ask, but it's just not as easy, especially when you're dealing with a whole group that's been uh, facing different challenges from a society that's just been strictly biased and in favor of one group of people. Um, and if anything, that I hope a lot of people learned in the last year during the back Black Lives Matter was to do some unpacking and do some educating. If you haven't, you guys should probably go back to that if you're listening to understand why a lot of people like Tiffany and myself are so passionate about this topic and other topics, especially when it comes to our culture of people. Uh, now, one thing I do disagree on is the fact that 
uh, what's killing our people. Yes, we have a lot of food deserts, but we're but we also are allowing these businesses to come into our communities that continue to promote poison. What are we talking? Liquor stores, fast food restaurants, and more into our black communities. Uh, and and we are social. We have been a lot of us just. It's just an educational piece, but we've been conditioned to believe that animals specifically is food. And it's not. If you look at our physical attributes, if you look at the rationale and truly look at the deep origins of humanity itself, we're engineered by natural selection. This is science, y'all. Um, we're engineered by natural selection to eat plants specifically. This is made for picking. These are not made for claws. We don't have the physical attributes to consume uh, animals um, in the capacity that we've been believed, even through the slaves, uh, the slavery years that was passed on, most natives in warmer climates were fruitarians. It's science to back that up. And a lot of our diet, specifically in the Black African American community, was just adopted in, uh, from what our slaves provided for us, including pigs and pork. Uh, I've seen something in the chat about Iowa producing uh, Iowa is number one, I think, still. They fight hand-to-hand -hand with North Carolina with being the largest hog-producing state. Uh, but I, everyone that's listening, if you're not vegan or not, when you buy from animal agriculture, you're supporting environmental racism, especially if you're buying pork, okay? And that's so critically to understand because North Carolina is the second producing hog in state where those farms, factory or not, are strategically placed in black rural communities where they are the highest demographics being admitted to the hospital due to the lagoons spilling into the wastage and more. So it's almost contradictive and also hypocritical for us to be consumers buying animal products that are doing so much damage to our own people, especially black people, but also ecosystems. It's just not sustainable and it's just unkind in many capacities. Lastly, I just wanna say this too. We have to realize there's a group of people on this panel and people that are listening, there's close to 8 billion people in this world. That means we're all gonna wake up tomorrow with close to 8 billion different per perspectives, points of views. You have some people that are religious, spiritual, Christians, Muslims, atheists, and more. We have to understand that not everyone's gonna be uniform in their thoughts. And we have to work together to hopefully understand each other's ways and to get along uh, because we got one planet, one shot, and one life, uh, but not we all are not gonna see eye to eye, but hopefully we can see some things eye to eye just to produce a better um, uh, society uh, of kind and compassion. Can I say something just really fast? Dominique, when you talk about the, the food deserts, my farm is literally across the street from a liquor store, from a, from a corner store, from a fast food restaurant, so. Let her, point. Let her finish. Let her finish. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I am. I'm, I'm. I'm segueing there. I wanted to ask Dominic real quick. You know, have you seen the film? They're trying to kill us. Yeah. The badass I'm, vegan. Yeah, I'm in the film. You're in it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that is exactly I, what I it's about. It's all, about. it's all about the fast food. Uh, come, the, I mean, they're trying to kill us, especially in. Black communities, Tiffany. I'm sorry, I just had to. Yeah. I thought no, I mean real. they can they can try, but that's why I say, if you have an urban farm, I have a two acre urban farm in the middle of a food desert. Yep. So that I, I I don't I can't hear that because you have a, a a liquor store, the Dairy Queen, a corner store, and a half beat up grocery store across the street from my farm. I can walk across the street with produce and take it to the corner store and ask the man in the corner store if I can leave my produce here. I can do the same thing across the street at the grocery store. I can give away produce as people walk by every day. I can open up my doors on my farm to the community and feed the people. You know what I'm saying? Like not everybody is see not everybody is eating on that level not everybody is going to a vegan restaurant some people just got to get it how they live out the community so if we are gonna be using farmers to grow food they need to be growing food to feed the community because not everybody can afford to go to the jamba juice 
to get their nutrients. You know what I'm saying? Oh. So are we feeding are we feeding those people who are really vulnerable and marginalized whose health and wellness is really poor? You know, Tim, so that, I, that'd be where my mom is. having debates and discussions. Let me let me jump back in one, one quick second. Tip, I wholeheartedly agree with you without a doubt. We actually need more urban farmers in our community like you. I'm from the hood too, west side of Chicago. I agree with you. I don't disagree with anything about urban farming. I think there needs to be more urban farming, if anything, to help uh, rebuild our communities and also to kind of uh, dismantle this shitty ass process of food deserts in general. Right. So, so I don't also have to make our money as farmers. So I will I, understand you wanting to take your value added product and create juices that, that people are going to purchase. But at the same time, I know that you will also have access to that, those food programs by other people because that's what you do. You teach people about health and nutrition. So we still have to earn a living, but at the same time, we still need to be able to give to our communities. And we can do that by having the conversations that you said, Dominique, and just being honest when we have the conversations, because we're not all like-minded, you know, but, but we can all find having, a common ground. That's why we were having this discussion today. And we have yep. um, a, a huge number of people watching on Zoom and thousands watching on Facebook. Hey, get different views in there and have a dialectic, an argument and a, a counter argument to reach a higher understanding of the given subject matter. And the given subject matter is our fundamental question that we started with that is the heart of every RAP Summit. How can we transition farmers and ranchers so that they can thrive on their land without using animals? And I do hope that in some world, we can marry people who are hungry uh, and needing, desperately needing good food, good fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, and legumes with the farmers who desperately need to start making those and get them yeah. together. And that's all we're trying to do here. Judy, you have your hands up and then we're gonna have to move on a little bit because we're run over. Yeah, well, we got Helen, I, I just, we got Helen. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that one of the biggest forms of racism is exactly, you know, getting those fast foods and liquor stores in in black neighborhoods and you know if we are subsidizing farmers why aren't we subsidizing more of being able to give tiffany money from the government to grow her food for her community because if i can pay two dollars for a Big Mac fries and all this that's gonna fill me up and the same $2 is one head of cauliflower, guess which one in Tiffany's community they're gonna pick? Tiffany, I mean, just shake your head. Am I right or wrong here, you know? And so knowing that, that's why we have to change laws. That's why we gotta shift the subsidies and that's why you know, yes, it would be nice to replace the system, but we got to know how to work within it and get these changes now. That's all I was wanting to say. Now, Thank you. I would love, I would love to. I, I appreciate that, and I really want to hear from Helen uh, Atto because she is also farming in her own community. How do you see this being addressed in your community, Helen? I, I want to say that I really agree with Tiffany, and then I'm going to tell you where I disagree. And, and part of why uh, I disagree, uh, Tiffany, is probably for the same reason that Dominic does. One of the people that farms the way I do is Eugene Cook. I nearly fell off my chair once listening to him. And then I got up and spoke next and realized that instead of feeding things to animals, collecting their manure and making compost, I've been learning for the last 20 years, but certainly the last five or 10 years, how to get as good a compost, putting that plant residue directly in my compost and on the soil. And, and Eugene's better at it than I am. In my community, I, I, I'm gonna laugh and, and, and say nicely, just what Tiffany said, I am surrounded by old white ranchers. <laughs> They're all over 60. And it's an old system and it's hard for them to change. And I am trying very hard to have compassion at the same time that I say, look at my corn. It's 
in this terrible agricultural crisis summer with, with record heat, record dry, and record fires, my farm is feeding the community and other people's corn crops are failing because I have a perennialized plant-based living root in the soil at all times. There's no bare soil on my farm system. And, and my neighbors are in crisis. So I'm taking my produce to the local restaurants and the co-op and I am saying, here's the crop, just pay me what you can. And, and they're doing wow. that. I'm in a position where I can do that. Eugene and I have had this conversation and he's not in the same position I am. So after talking to Eugene, I'm trying to do more because I have been given such privilege to do so. But I, I wanna say that we gotta feed people We've got to keep the agro, agro ecosystem healthy as well. And that medicine also has to come into this in the farm bill. We need to talk about who gets the money. And it shouldn't be the big farms and the people who have been getting it all these years. It should be different. But we also have to look at our medical system in Portland I've been working with some local urban farmers and they are getting money from Medicare and Medicaid to help. They, the doctor has to write the prescription for vegetable and fruit CSA. And then they can get, they can support some of these urban farms with the money to have an anti-diabetes and an anti-cancer diet. And it comes from the medical system. So there are many ways to bring this money in, it, if we if we go through the community, go through the consumer, but we also look at some of these big ag programs and 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 medical programs and and get our legislation changed around that way. We are thinking outside the box here today to try to answer the question: How can farmers and ranchers transition out of animal agriculture and still thrive on their land? And you know we. I believe that the animal agriculture system is in many ways a house of cards. And if you pull one thing out of it, it collapses. Uh, for example, I was told that statistically, um, American dogs and cats would amount to either the ninth or the fifth largest meat eating country in the world if counted as their own country. If dogs and cats in the United States simply stopped eating meat, boom, the animal agriculture system would collapse. Um, and so I think that we have to figure out ways where we can maybe think strategically and do things differently to try to achieve our outcome. Dr. Rao, I do want to ask you about how Gandhi achieved this with one simple thing, getting everybody or a huge percentage, millions of people in India to change one thing. And, and when he started that, probably everybody said it would never happen, but it did. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, he, he asked people to just change their clothes. He said, just stop wearing clothes made by um, uh, factories in England, start wearing clothes made by Indians in India. And that one shift, at first people laughed at him, you know, how can you just change your clothes and expect the, the colonial system to collapse? But it did. Because when 180 million Indians started wearing Khadi clothes, the British mills in Manchester had to go bankrupt. And you know the British government was on its knees begging to negotiate with Gandhi because that was the largest industry in England at that time. So that's how the round table conference happened in 1931. And so if you look at the history of India, you know this, this one simple change that he asked people to do, within 10 years, uh, India went from a country that was begging for the British to listen to them to a country that was at the table. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, I have a, I have a question that I would love to ask Nicole. Um, you know, I, Nicole Rosa Marino has a ton of experience um, in the world that she lives in. I can only imagine that you must think you live in your own country, uh, your own world. I know sometimes I feel like I live in my own country over here at Rowdy Girl and it's only 147 acres. I, I dream 
of being surrounded by thousands and thousands and thousands of acres that are dedicated to the kind of preservation and life enhancing programs that you brought to the face of the earth. Nicole, how as a visionary, and you are one, do you see us making these changes? Uh, well, thanks, Renee. It's hard to go after Dr. Rao and pretend I'm a visionary. Um, you're just you so impressive, Dr. Rao. And Tiffany and Dominic and all the rest. I really enjoyed the conversation. You know, for me, Renee, it really boils down to two things. I mean, and I'm not, I didn't create this, uh, this saying, but it's, it's about destroying ugliness and creating beauty. And the policy changes you all have been discussing are vitally important, um, particularly for the destruction of ugliness. But for creation of beauty, that is in all of our power. Tiffany's creating beauty, Dominic's creating beauty, Helen's creating beauty. We do this um, without alienation. Um, you know, like Helen, I I'm surrounded by um, Anglo ranching families. They are our friends. Um, they are uh, interested in what we are doing. Um, we talk to them. Uh, we run educational programs about our bison and prairie dogs to really get, you know, get that to that, that second part of the solution of creating beauty. You can't do that when you're alienating people. And, and so when we buy land and create wildlife refuges, we have that engagement uh, with the local community. And I think that that is really an important um, part of our approach that um, we don't even know yet the positive um, traffic cascade that could perhaps result from our work inspiring others within the community. But I would also say it is within everybody's power to do what we're doing, to create huge preserves. Um, all we have to do is act collectively um, and you know, basically pool our money uh, to buy land that is for the wild ones. And sure, we have that rescued animal component and that is important to us, but the, the final objective is to have land that's not for human use, it's for the wild ones because the wild ones need it and we need it and our planet needs that needs it. So join, that's really where I come down. Can you join our committee afterwards and help us do that? Will you be on a you committee know, with us? Well, yeah, let's talk about that. But what I was thinking is, you know, I'd be happy to write a piece about how to create a wildlife refuge in your backyard, because I do think the funding is available. And it's not just about consumers buying products. It's about consumers getting behind ideas and donating their money because of a compelling um, idea that's permanent creating a wildlife refuge forever. So yes, I'd be happy to talk with you further, Renee. That's great, Nicole. That's one of the, one of the main outcomes I wanted in bringing you on is to really engage you in that conversation on how we can take action in that regard. Thank you. And Jane, I know we're, uh, we're, we're we are over time. We're, uh, uh, we're ready to, to move along here. So if it's okay with you, I'm gonna go ahead and thank our sponsors. Um, we, of which we could never do this. We have the incredible Miyoko's Creamery, of course, Jane Unchained News, uh, Veg Fund. Miyoko's and Veg Fund are our, uh, our leading sponsors, our, titan our titanium uh, sponsors. We have V-Dog and Free From Harm, the amazing all y'all's food that makes its jerky y'all, that's our corporate sponsor. And we also have a cashew, cashew yogurt, local right in Houston, makes homemade cashew yogurt that is just amazing. Hungry Planet uh, is, uh, is an amazing uh, food that, that actually sent some food to us that is incredible. We love it. And the Roaring Vegans, uh, love you guys. Uh, a new sponsor, Compassion Digital, and our incredibly, we're so grateful for our media sponsors. Jane Unchained, The Sentient Media, and Veg World Magazine. Back to you, Jane. Yes, and uh, one of our biggest sponsors who is just uh, somebody who 
Uh, I love, well, for, I love Veg Fund. They help uh, Jane Unchained boost posts when we do our daily vegan cooking show. And uh, thank, thank you, Veg Fund, for all you do, helping empower people who are trying to get the message out. And one of my personal heroes, there are so many here today, is Miyoko Shinner of Miyoko's Creamery. And she is literally changing the world with her vegan butters and cheeses that I do it right here. When I bring people in, I don't even tell them that it's not dairy cheese and they gobble it up. And I say, ah, this is Miyoko's vegan cheese. Roll the video. Hi, I'm Miyoko Shinner, founder and CEO of Miyoko's Creamery. The Creamery of Tomorrow is based on compassion and sustainability for all living beings. We're located in Sonoma County, surrounded by cows, and I wanna make sure that our products will help these cows live their lives as they see fit and not be commodities. We're working with farmers to help them transition to a cow-free economy where they can grow crops to support industries such as ours. Join us in a new tomorrow. And if y'all would sponsor the Rap Summit, our next one, if you're out there, please join us. Uh, we are we are revolutionizing the way we look at uh, look at farmers, the way we look at farming. And so, Jane, thank you so much for for co-hosting this event with with me. Uh, we, we could not do this without your dynamic and fierce uh, outlook behind the scenes. You are an incredible force. You have taught me so much. I will tell the world that Jane Velez Mitchell, like she always says, everybody else is her hero. She is my hero. And I may not tell that to her face, but I'll tell y'all loud and proud. Thank you, Jane. Well, I, I want to thank our team behind the scenes. We've had many meetings to coordinate all the videos and all the guests. Kamito Kwan, Ray, Rebecca, and Lisa. Lisa Brown is on vacation in New Orleans and stopped a party with her friends to be here and to do this. So thank you, Lisa. Um, and I hope I wish I had a quarter of your organizational skills. Uh, so I, I hope I didn't leave anybody out, but um, what? We got everybody. I said, thank God for Lisa. I don't know what I, I've known that woman for 15 years. I don't know what we do without Lisa Brown. Thank you, everybody. It's so exciting. Uh, good luck, Lawrence, on your transition. And and uh, Tiffany and Dom and uh, Nicole and Judy and Silesh and um, all the folks here. Ellen, um, I hope I didn't leave anybody out. Together we can do this. Uh, what starts as an idea becomes an action and a movement. And we are going to hit the tipping point. Vegan World 2026. See you next time. Thank you guys so much. Love you. Appreciate you. Lawrence Candy, I am inspired and motivated by your transition. Thank you.